Welcome to the Essential Substance Abuse Skills webinar series. I am Karen Summers and I will be administering today's webinar. Today, Denise Casillas will be speaking on group counseling. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center, or ATTC. The National American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC is one of four national focus centers which serves the ATTC network. The ATTC network is a nationwide network made up of 10 regional centers, four national focus centers, and a network coordinating office. The map on this slide shows the states served by each of the regional ATTCs. To learn more about our center, the network, or your regional center, please visit our website. This series is designed to be a broad overview to assist in preparing for the written alcohol and drug certification examinations, to enhance existing knowledge, and to improve overall competence and treatment outcomes. Please be aware that this series is not meant to stand alone, and previous education and training is necessary in order to pass alcohol and drug certification exams. We recommend that if you are preparing for an exam that you seek additional preparatory help and let this course be one of many tools you use to prepare. Our next webinar in this series is scheduled for Wednesday, November 20th, where Ed Haycraft will be presenting on Counseling Families, Partners, and Significant Others. In addition to this webinar series, we offer another series titled the American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health Webinar Series which presents on current topics of interest in the behavioral health field. The next session in our American Indian and Alaska Native Behavioral Health webinar series will be held on November 6th from 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern Time, where Ken Winters will present on adolescent neurobiology and marijuana use in his presentation titled, 50 Shades of Developing Gray Matter. For more information on either of our webinar series, you can contact me at the email address or phone number provided on this slide. Our center is a NADAC certified educational provider and we're happy to provide you with CEUs. The cost is $10 to do so. The CEU request form along with a copy of the PowerPoint will be sent to you within 24 hours of today's session. If you don't receive the email with handouts within two business days, please let us know. In addition to the PowerPoint handout and CEU request form, a link to our GIPR evaluation will be included in the email you receive following today's webinar. We invite you to participate in this brief online customer survey. The survey asks about your satisfaction with the event and will take less than 10 minutes to complete. GIPRA stands for the Government Performance and Results Act, and SAMHSA asks us to evaluate our events in order to comply with this act and provide improved performance assessment and accountability. SAMHSA uses information collected by these surveys to determine how many people have attended our events, your satisfaction with our events, and how useful our events are to you. We hope you'll assist us in gathering information about our services by participating in our evaluation. Before we start today's session, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the GoToWebinar system. To hide or expand your toolbar at any time, you can click the red arrow on the top right side of your window. To expand your screen, click the middle button in the top right hand corner. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar. Please use the question chat box to share your questions and comments. Your questions will be only visible to me, the webinar moderator. I will pass your questions along to the presenter at appropriate points in the presentation. We would also like you to be aware that this webinar records participant attention time. If you minimize the webinar or are working in another window, the system will record your participation as an active, which may be reflected in the number of CEUs received. Today's speaker is Denise Casillas. Denise is an enrolled member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe. She is the director of the Four Bands Healing Center and is also a member of her tribe's behavioral health crisis response team on the Cheyenne River. Please join me in welcoming Denise. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Karen. You're welcome. I am honored to be able to present to you today. Um, you know, the, the main thing that we're going to really take a good look at is how you define, you know, your task as a group leader, um, the development of the group, you know, what, what you know, goals you're going to accomplish, 
um, how big you want your group. We're also going to describe and select and appropriately use, you know, the many different strategies that are widely known as well as culturally appropriate um, for the different types of groups that you know we do. And then of course then to finally become familiar with um, the research on group counseling, which I'm sure a lot of us um, don't spend a whole lot of time trying to understand. So we're going to go right into the presentation on group counseling. There's many different types of groups and, you know, from psychoeducational, um, skills development, problem solving, which, you know, cognitive behavioral does a lot of uh, key identifiers for thought processes and behavior um, to, you know, work on the solutions of, you know, the, the actions of the, of the clientele. Then there are support groups like NA or AA or just talking circles. And then you've got the interpersonal process group. <clears throat> now, there's definitely some fixed and revolving types of group membership. We have, you know, the open, you know, group versus a closed group. When you have an open format, um, new members can come into the group anytime. So, you know, let's say you're in the third week of your curriculum and you have a new member that comes in, well, you know, since it's a continuous process, even if they, let's say it's a five-week group and they enter on the third week, they just will continue and stay until the first three sessions that they miss. Um, you know, so it's, non, you know, and there's really no reason why, you know, they couldn't participate at that point. And that's for a lot of the non-confidential, or, well, every group is confidential, but um, like I said, uh, drug education class for DUI, you know, those are more open formats and, you know, folks come and go can constantly. But let's say you're doing an actual treatment group um, uh, for depression, anxiety, or drug and alcohol counseling. You know, a lot of those groups are closed because of the confidentiality and the rapport that's built with the group. So if a new member came in halfway, you know, they would feel like that person is really, in, you know, invading their space, their privacy. They don't want to have to tell and share their story all over again, you know, they because they've already shared their story, story and they've already built, you know, somewhat of a, a trust between the other members. So it becomes um, pretty difficult to have folks um, come into a closed group. And a lot of times, you know, that's kind of what happens with closed treatment programs. Um, but on a behavioral health side, uh, a lot of times there are closed groups too, especially in the skills um, format, uh, psychoeducational groups, um, and really the interpersonal groups too. Now we're going to talk about the composition of the group. So like, for example, when you're interviewing, you know, um, doing a clinical interview to see if the person is appropriate for, say, uh, a group on depression, and this person has disclosed that they were raped, um, that they've recently been raped. Now, you have to make a clinical judgment at that point whether or not this person is appropriate for a depression group if they have never sought help for, you know, that, that current issue that they just disclosed. So it's really important before you place a client in a particular group that you really look at the need of the client versus this is, you know, they want to do it in a group format versus, you know, on an individual basis. Um, what all resources are available to these groups outside of this group, you know, those are really important. For example, let's say the person, you know, starts to really work on issues and they start having a, 
you know, a breakdown outside of the group, uh, will you give them a contact number for them to call in, you know, for more um, uh, counseling, more therapy, uh, maybe they need to go to the ER, you know, to just get more deeper help. And uh, when you got the nature of the group, are you going to allow them to be able to com com communicate with each other beyond the group format? So well, are they going to start to hang out outside of the group? And what does that mean for the whole group? If it's only a couple people versus, you know, the whole group all going, you know, for coffee or whatever. Now, optimally, the size of the group is you'd really want to keep it small from 8 to 10 to 12 clients. Sometimes that's not possible, especially like, say, a, a treatment group that's more open-ended. Um, we get anywhere from 15 to 20 plus clients. And it does get a little bit too much, but you know, the more you can get people to maintain abstinence from their drug of choice, the better. Um, the frequency, you know, like when depending on, you know, the ASAM criteria or your own program's requirements, you know, the intensity and really the type of group becomes part of your um, matching process in your clinical interview. You know, is this person, does this person need more than just the group? You know, should they be seeing a counselor or a therapist along the side to continue to work on some of the deeper issues? Um, the duration, this often depends, you know, on what type of group as well as treatment versus, you know, the continuum of care. So let's say they do a five or six week treatment group, but beyond that, you know, they need to continue, um, let's say, with some individual work um, with their therapist or their sponsor or however. You know, ultimately it boils down to funding and, of course, health insurance. Really, they that right there often dictates, you know, how long a person can actually be in treatment and, of course, you know, the, the frequency of the treatment process. We have, um, in our um, program up here, we have a lot of people who are voluntary, but majority are involuntarily committed to treatment. So, you know, when you really look at the definition, the result of all the forces that act on all the members it's the same, you know, the point is, is to get them to be in this group. Or, you know, let's say, you know, the, the group itself is, is pretty darn cool, you know, the activities that they do, you know, the, the dynamics of the group, you know, so it boils down to the attractiveness of the group. The group itself, you know, the members want to be a part of it. So, you know, they, they may ask to come back through and be back in the same group again. Um, and when I talk about confidentiality and the trust, you know, it's really important that group cohesiveness really takes place. You know, as the membership grows and they learn to accept each other and their approval of, a, of each other, you know, this is really the utmost important step in their developmental sequence, you know, in the group. So, you know, when they, the outcome of the group process, you know, how well did they do? And, you know, did they meet the group's overall focus and goals? And, you know, a lot of people just show up and they're just there. They don't really provide um, content to the group process. And, and the group leader can ultimately identify those who are literally working, you know, the, the group's goals and their own individual treatment goals, too. So, you know, you can tell when somebody's... Um, committed to, you know, seeking, you know, ultimately achieving their goal, goals for the group's plan. Now, according to the research that Dick Hoff and Lakin have stated is patients indicated that primary mode of help in group therapy is through mutual support. A lot of times, you know, our clientele have no idea that other folks are experiencing not not only the exact same thing, but very, very similar situations. And once, you know, another person discloses that, you know, they got their kids taken away and they're trying very hard to sober up to, you know, get their kids back, but they're homeless. They don't have the place of their own. 
you know, maybe they don't have a GED, so they can't really get a job. I mean, so there's just a lot of barriers. And and then all of a sudden, one of the other clients realizes, oh my God, that's the exact same thing I'm I'm going through right now. I want my kids back too, but I've not been able to secure a home, you know, because to be able to rent a home, um, they look at my credit. Well, I don't even have any credit, or my credit is shot. I can't get it. I can't rent a place, and so on and so forth. So you know. I think that by realizing that they aren't going through this alone, that's when that acceptance really starts happening. So, the, so we're going to continue on with the research of this. And there were members who reported themselves improved. Those members who reported themselves improved were significantly more likely to have truly felt accepted by the other members. They perceived similarity of some kind among the group members. Like I said, you know, their stories were, were very similar. Um, they made specific reference to particular individuals when queried about their experiences. You know, I've, I've run groups where that exact thing happened, even amongst our youth, you know, the adolescents. A lot of them come from broken homes, so they're being raised by relatives. Um, you know, they feel like they don't belong, that they don't really have a place to, you know, call home. And so when these, these youth, you know, realize that, hey, I'm not the only one going through this, you know, it's, it's in these um, moments when they realize that there's other people who ha are going through this very same thing with me, and it's not so scary anymore. And it's really important when you establish a group that you formulate guidelines. You know, the rules of the group are really important, you know, by establishing parameters you provide, you know, behavioral, general behavioral expectations for the group. And when you clarify the purpose of these rules, this helps the clients understand, you know, that one, they cannot interrupt each other. And two, let's say they can't just get up and leave and not come back to the group. Three, you know, that you have to lay down the confidentiality rule. You know, what, what's said here stays here. Um, although, you know, the other issue of, you know, if I need to report anything that's happened, you know, I am a manda mandatory reporter and it is important that I, you know, report that or I will work with you to report anything that you disclose um, to the appropriate authorities. You know, and it's important that you allow the client to make suggestions into the group's guidelines, you know. A lot of the clients are savvy. They've gone through treatment or they've, you know, been through therapy. And so, you know, they know just very simple, you know, rules. Um, and the other thing is don't make them too complicated, you know, or too restrictive. You know, you want the group to be able to flow and, and not have too many um, restrictive um, rules that prevent them from really sharing or getting, you know, to a place where, you know, the, the movement really does start happening for them, their own personal growth and development. And it is really important that you make sure that all the members feel safe in that group, you know, that they maintain a honest honesty and integrity and, of course, respect for themselves and the others in the group. But, and if it's important, you know, that the group begins on time and ends on time, that punctuality is also uh, a particularly important piece of this. For example, in DBT, you know, they do chains, and chains are where, you know, you have to identify, you know, what led up to your being late for the group or having to leave early, you know, um, and it's, it's really establishing, making that person accountable for their own actions because, you know, if, if they're not there when it's time for the group to start and the group has to start without them, and then the person comes in late and disrupts that flow, then everybody is kind of thrown off for the rest of the group. Some people it bothers, you know, the punctuality, and some people it really doesn't. So that's why it's really important when you set these ground rules that you make sure that the whole group is, is really okay with all the parameters. Now, as a group later, if punctuality is, you know, one of your ultimate um, rules, then, you know, you need to make that very clear right from the start. Now, 
motivational, um, there, there's many different approaches to groups, and motivational interviewing is one approach. And with motivational uh, interviewing, there's an acronym that is used, and it's basically it's o OPEN, O-P-E-N. So open with the group's purpose to learn more about members, thoughts, concerns, and choices. Personal choice is emphasized. The environment is one of respect and encouragement for all the members of the group. And then to have truly a non-confrontational nature of the group. You know, if somebody feels like they're being confronted, they're going to shut down. You know, they, there's a lot of folks who are very vulnerable and sensitive when they're first really trying to sober up. And they're not going to take lightly to confrontational members in the group. And it's really, really important that you understand that as a group leader, that you are able to make sure that if you find somebody that's going to be very, very forceful in the group, that you know you either you know remove that person from the group and place them in another group, or you make sure that you talk to them prior to the group really beginning. We're going to talk about the development of a group process. And you know, when you develop when a group is developing, you're going to look at the forming of it, the storming, the norming, performing, and adjourning. Now, talk about rhyming, but it's really important when you when you look at the stages of a group development that you understand that you know not only are these rhyming words to help us remember what's happening when the group is happening, but to to understand that you know as the group is forming, they're getting to know each other. And they're learning as uh, to understand what is their task as a group. So you know you're going to have some introductory exercises. This is the time that the group members and group leader get to know each other, and you give the group enough you know freedom to allow their own initiative to take place, but yet enough guidance that they feel safe. So you're going to have folks that are going to want to talk and monopolize the whole group, okay? As a leader, you're going to need to do, you know, the guiding, you know, when when is it time to, you know, shut down that person or stop them from, you know, taking up all the time? Cuz what it really boils down to is how comfortable are people with silence? And silence is a really powerful um, tool like some people can't stand silence, so they just talk up a storm because nobody else is talking. Other people don't like talking in front of people, so they use the silence to their advantage. By staying silent, they don't have to disclose anything. They don't have to share anything because, you know, obviously somebody else is taking up the time. So they've, you got to find, you got to be able to, as a leader, you know, search, you know, for that that strength within yourself to determine, okay, who's just sitting here letting this person talk? And is this person really telling things of substance or are they just filling the, the silence, you know? So let's look, move on to storming. Um, so we got some tasks that need to be fulfilled and folks don't want to do it, okay? But they become irritable and edgy, you know, in, in achieving these tasks. Let's say you had them do some homework and they were supposed to bring this homework back. Well, they didn't do it, you know, for whatever reasons, because maybe they have not really invested into this group process. So they begin to wonder if this group is really necessary. You know, do I really need these skills, you know? Because, well, let's face it, you know, an alcoholic, really at some point does not want to quit drinking. You know, they they still think about it constantly. They remember, you know, what it feels like. And they they really want that feeling back. So that's when this, this challenging comes in. And it's it's really important as as a group leader to determine where is this person at, you know, by checking in with them, you know, review and evaluate where each person is so far in this group by you even just checking in, you know, you, you're giving them that sense of belonging, the sense of security that they truly need to feel as they, you know, begin a whole new way of thinking and life. 
um, building skills, you know. But um, you're going to have definitely the one member in the group who will test your skills and authority um, very rebelliously, may I add. Um, they may have a sense of apathy or hopelessness, like, for example, you know, you know that's, that never works for me. I've done this before and it doesn't work and, you know, just, just really never gave it a chance, but yet that's all they stand on is that, you know, this, this has never worked for me and I don't think it'll ever, ever work for anybody else either. So, you know, they try to get people to side with them that they don't need to be there, they don't need to do the, the work. And definitely test the leadership um, authoritative skills. And I've been there, and it's not fun. But if you can get through it, you know, and help them um, really start at least trying it one step at a time. This is where norming comes in, allocating and settling into group roles, developing a procedure for achieving these group tasks. So, for example, you start recognizing what skill or what gift does each member have, and if you can use that to their advantage. For example, you know, let's say the silent one, ask them to pray to open the group. You know, um, even if they say, you know, something like, well, I've never prayed before. You know, I always say, well, you know, we all start somewhere, and sometimes it's just, you know, good to just say what's in our heart this morning, you know. And a lot of times, then the prayer comes out so true and genuine, and it's like, wow, you know, you've really begun something with the trust that is that continues to grow between the group members, and or maybe the the you know rebellious one, ask them to pray, you know, and again they'll probably say, well, I've never prayed before, and blah blah blah, you know, I wasn't raised that way, and just say, well, you know what, maybe it's time we just start to pray and ask with, you know, creator to see what's in our hearts. And, you know, I know that may seem like I'm saying, you know, we need to, to do some religion here in group. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just reaching for a higher power with the group. That's, that's all I'm saying. And a lot of times this really helps, you know, make the relationship stronger between the group members. And again, you know, it helps clarify the boundaries and group rules. Because as you assist these members to move into their roles and they start taking more responsibility for, you know, how the tone of, they, by saying a prayer, they outset the tone for the rest of the group and the group members. And I have found that, you know, really the sense of enthusiasm, you know, really becomes more enhanced as members begin to take on more responsibility for their own leadership in the group you know, by maybe having each one take turns with the opening prayer and then the closing prayer. Um, you know, just real simple things like that give them a sense of belonging and purpose. So as they're performing, um, the group then becomes involved in activities in achieving the task of, you know, the group's focus, let's say abstinence. And then in that process, you know, they begin to encourage each other, and you no longer have to try to maintain the balance as strongly as you did in the beginning, because the group starts to be, to maintain, you know, the balance themselves and recognize what tasks need to be um, completed before you. Sometimes, you know, so this is it, it slowly be, the group slowly takes it on themselves and you slowly tend to um, start letting go of the reins. You know, you start, they start feeling as well as you start feeling that the actual overall job is getting done. That problems that, that they face, now they bring to the group and within the group are easily starting to overcome, you know, the, the, the conflicts and the barriers that they're experiencing outside the group, and af after some point, you know, the leader themselves doesn't need to intervene much, you know, you're almost just as an observer, and it becomes really, really important that you let that process to continue, you know, don't try to continue to take the reins, you know, let them continue to, you know, um, build that relationship, you know, help 
to solve their own problems. And once they realize that, the, the trust you know, begins between this group, that they're a cohort, that they, they are maintaining sobriety together, they're solving their problems together, and then outside of treatment, you know, they are attending support groups or maybe they're just hanging out, you know, with their non or their sober friends um, that they've now created. So as we get close to wrapping up the group, you know, we're adjourning, um, you start to say goodbye, you know, you evaluate the group process. Did we achieve what we set out to achieve, you know? And then you help the group members to say goodbye and, and face the next challenge, which is, you know, functioning outside of this group, you know, making plans for the future. Maybe they're going to move into aftercare, or maybe they've, you know, this was aftercare and they're moving into, you know, life without treatment in this group. And it's really important to allow them, you know, to make plans to get together, you know, to reminisce, um, to plan maybe, you know, a yearly reunion or so on and so forth, you know. The group members that often deny the end and make plans to keep in touch, you know, it's it's almost like they 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 tend to regress to their former problems or patterns of behavior. So it's really key that as a, as a leader, you know, you encourage them to use each other when, you know, the time is needed. Reach out to one, one another. And there's so many ways to communicate anymore beyond the telephone face-to-face. -face. And, of course, you know, I'm not a big on Facebook because it can get, you know, on Twitter and all these other social media outlets, but it can become a very... Um, a uh, very, you know, unique way to stay in touch with one another. And I, and I think that it's important as a leader that you do encourage all the ways that they stay in touch. So in facilitating uh, the groups, there are three functions that you as a leader should keep in mind, you know, which ultimately is creating the group and then shaping the group and then maintaining the group by setting down, you know, the guidelines that really how you're maintaining the group. So when you're creating the group, remember that uh, in most cases, you are the single common element among the group members. So you're the one who interviewed them and placed them in this group. And as group leader, then you are the one that they will always look to, every single one of them as group leader, you know, for kind of, you know, justification. Um, is it okay? Can we do this? Is it okay to do this? All of that stuff. And in shaping the group, your experience and behavior, as well as the expectations of the group members, will guide the formation of norms. So really, this is where, you know, when you set down the rules of the behavior in the group, they will help maintain it. So for example, um, I've had one group member who liked to fall asleep in group and um, it it really started to get on the nerves of some of the other group members and they really wanted to know you know why was this person falling asleep in group and we come to find out that he would eat a big meal and had high blood sugar but he didn't know it and um, basically you know got so sleepy he could not even function so part of his process was to go get a physical, and he ended up getting himself on some diabetic medication to help keep his blood sugar low. And um, after that, he seemed to be able to, to function, you know, in the group without falling asleep. So some examples of group norms. Remember when I was talking about the non-confrontational approach? Well, being non-judgmental is really key too, you know, in getting, gaining acceptance of others. Um, the group member who wants to point out everybody else's flaws will tend to turn off a lot of people. So it's really important to help people understand that as they are self-disclosing, willingly self-disclosing, it's important not to judge, you know, each other because we're all there for some reason or another and that you want to encourage their participation for all of the group members by respecting each other and, of course, the confidentiality, you know. And when that happens, then, of course, you know, they begin to really value the importance of the group. 
they recognize that there is um, support available within their, you know, their colleagues, their whole group members, and that this respect, you know, extends outside of the group too. And you know, the being judgmental and non non-judgmental and non-confrontational doesn't mean they're not willing to hear and accept, you know, feedback. It's just that the feedback shouldn't be mean. It shouldn't, you know, make them feel bad or not feel safe. It's really important that, you know, they understand the way to give, provide feedback. So maintaining the group. When in, in maintaining the group, you function as a mediator. So you're handling issues that might arise which threaten group cohesion. And you'll do that a lot, especially in the beginning as the group is, you know, becoming a more cohesive group. Your job is then to help the group function properly by showing confidence in your abilities as a group leader, remaining calm and objective, and by providing a safe environment. You know, by checking, you know, the person who likes to speak a lot, that helps the group recognize that you recognize this person is speaking a lot, or the person who becomes very confrontational by saying, you know, that's not appropriate in this group, and I need you to not be so confrontational. Just, just point out the behavior. That shows your confidence in your abilities, and by remaining calm and stating the obvious, you know, you do provide a safe environment by doing that for the group. So when you, as a facilitator of the group, you know, understand your techniques that will make a successful group, you know, it's, it becomes a very easy um, kind of role to slide into. So like you maintain a safe environment. And then um, definitely, you know, if you have to jot down some notes, either while you're in group or as soon as the group is over with, to be able to summarize, you know, as needed throughout the group or even at the end when your five weeks or six weeks are up, you know, to serve as the group historian. Say, remember when we were talking about this topic and now look where we are, you know. The clients remain in the here and now, but by redirecting them and bringing them back to the purpose of the group. So a lot of times, they will go off task, and if they recognize that they can get you off task so easy, they will take turns getting you off task, so they never have to really achieve the goals of the group. So, you know, most of us are in the helping field for many reasons, and we are quick to try to solve their problems, but that in itself is ultimately what we're not trying to do. You want the clients to discover their own answers for themselves, you know, as they live their own life. So it's important that you recognize that by always offering solutions, you know, may not be the best thing, that, that they need to come to the understanding, you know, of their situation and what is the best way to solve the problem for themselves. And it's also okay to have fun have a sense of humor, but definitely maintain your professional judgment um, in, in, at all times in the group. So as a facilitator, it is helpful to assist clients by pointing out the following four things to one another. So for example, you know, currently this is what your behavior is like, and this is how your behavior might make others feel. You know, like say somebody who's always confrontational in the group. And this is how your behaviors may influence others around you. Others around you start to shut down when you become very confrontational. And how does your behavior influence your opinion of yourself? You know, a lot of folks don't recognize that they have that need for like a sense of power or um, to be like, the group leader, like, you know, gang behavior, that by being so mean and whatnot, everybody shuts down and listens to them, and that to them is a sign of respect. 
when in fact it's the exact opposite and they don't recognize it. That, you know, how a, gr a gang functions versus group are two very different things. Motivational interviewing suggests that handling resistance in group. So when you're handling resistance in a group and negative comments arise, you need to permit somebody else to put in an alternate viewpoint. So you shouldn't, as a group leader, always have the best answer. That's why you're having group because, you know, other folks, you can learn just as well from other viewpoints, I guess, that other folks may have. And then, you know, emphasize the most relevant comments that they have made in this group process that, you know, seems to be a way to calm the group down. So, for example, use a group decisional balance exercise to diffuse the resistance. You know, and this is just one um, technique you can use as in this um, picture here. You know, use the scale or these rocks balancing on each other or, you know, this person meditating or this person walking on the high wire with the whole load on his shoulders. So by using the group decisional balance exercise to diffuse resistance, so the positive, the benefits of the status quo. So by maintaining the status quo, you know, the you don't know, you never rock the boat, okay? But then there's not so good things about the status quo by not rocking the boat, you're also not solving a problem. And so, you know, not so good things continue to maintain. So by changing the status quo, you are solving the problem, but maybe you're also improving a situation. And so by helping them to understand that, you know, by not saying anything, by staying silent, you know, it's, it's really not solving a problem. You know, it's only enhancing that person's um, self, you know, awareness that, oh, they respect me enough to just stay silent and listen to me, when in fact, that's not the point at all. Maybe they've tuned that person out, and they just stay silent until, you know, the group leader steps in and asks them to give somebody else a chance to speak. So it's, it's, uh, it can become very dis dysfunctional very fast if, you know, you don't utilize a, um, an exercise to diffuse, you know, what's taking place in the group. Now, this is always a very key thing, transference and counter-transference in the group. Now, transference in the group is an unrealistic perception or reaction to another by a client that is transferred from an earlier experience or attitude. So, for example, the client sees the therapist or the group leader um, as similar to somebody from their childhood, let's say an auntie or older sister or, you know, somebody that they cared about. And so, you know, they place that same feeling onto the therapist. And, you know, then, but the therapist a lot of times has no idea this is happening and will eventually find out. The counter-transference, though, is the reactions the therapists have toward their clients that may interfere with their objectivity. So, like, for example, the therapist sees the client that sees a client in the group that reminds them of somebody, you know, from their childhood or their past and is not able to maintain a clear, objective um, persona with this particular client. So really what, you know, you need to look for in your group is differences in the group once the counselor enters or leaves. So, for example, you know, what, what do people react like when you enter the room? And then the seating patterns. You know, a lot of times it's really important as you watch the seating patterns in the group, um, especially a cultural group. You'll tend to see, like, say, all the natives in the room, all we will stick together and then all the non-natives will stick together and so on and so forth, or all the females will stick together and all the males. So it's, it, it varies from, you know, group to group, you know, how they end up 
sitting, and then the interactions. You know, um, some will react different ways to certain members. You know, um, maybe the females will react. You know negatively to the males in the room and vice versa. So, you know, the clients are really in tune to you as a group leader, as a therapist, and it's important that you recognize that and you react your reactions to the clients. And if you feel that this is might become a very serious problem, you need to really take a good look at that and address that. Now, transference is so powerful and so, oh my goodness, ubiquitous that the leader shall have no favorite, you know, seems to be essential for the stability of every working group. You know, and that at times come, becomes hard because as the group progresses, what you're going to end up finding is that you're going to want to encourage the ones that are really working the process because they're easier. You know, they are wanting to change their life. They're wanting to get through this group. Whereas the ones who don't want to do the work, that just takes extra time and extra energy. And, you know, this, this whole thing, you know, does become a major chore versus an actual exciting process. As a result, transference may cause the therapy group to grant the leaders superhuman powers. <laughs> Members often expect the leader to sense their needs and expectations, you know, like we can read minds, you know, and that they put us up on a pedestal, that we're able to really change lives. Well, you know, the person who can only change the life is themselves. And if they put that much power into the group leader, then, you know, they're going to be sorely disappointed. And countertransference may cause the group complexity and stagnation in their healing, you know, and so really the transference overall is definitely a very difficult situation to become more familiar with, um, become strong enough to um, recognize that it's happening and to actually do something about it. So the next phase we're going to move into here is a therapeutic community. So about 40 years, therapeutic communities have been used for treatment of drug and abuse addictions by having drug-free residential settings, using a hierarchical model, the many stages you could progress through, combined rehabilitation with habilitation. There's, you know, many different, you know, self-help and self-care. Uh, models out there, and then, of course, mutual self-help. Rehabilitation versus habilitation. Rehabilitation is, is relearning or reestablishing healthy functioning, you know, building skills and values as well as regaining physical and emotional health. When people first come into basically any kind of group, you know, they a lot of times are just at rock bottom. And, you know, their health is shot, their well-being is shot, you know, maybe they've lost their job, they've lost their home, they've lost their kids, they've lost their driver's license, you know, it's, it's, their life is a mess. And so, you know, by relearning and reestablishing themselves in order to just function in the world is a huge step that they need to make. So the habilitation is almost like learning for the first time again the behavioral skills, the attitudes, and the values associated with socialized living. So, for example, let's say a person has maintained their addiction for 30 plus years. Well, in that time, they forgot to, how it, to function without being under the influence of something. So, by re, having to relearn what it means, you know, you know, how to act appropriately amongst, you know, society. You know, what a, how do they act, you know, when they're confronted by other people who are in a very bad way? You know, and what are their values? Because they're going to be confronted with folks who want them to maintain their addiction. And, you know, they're going to be fighting their own addiction and their own recovery. So, 
you know, they're going to have to learn what are the most important things in their life. You know, maintaining a sober home, maintaining sober friends, you know. Yeah, we can't pick our relatives, but we can sure pick who we socialize with and allow into our lives. So the habilitation piece is really, really key in the group process, you know, that you're trying to do, you know, um, skills living, let's say skills building group, you know, of, of just being out there functioning amongst the people, you know, what it means to fill out job applications, what, what do I have to do to try to get my kids back, to get my driver's license back, you know, what are all the pieces to even maintain a checking account, um, to pay bills, to, you know, have my own home, um, so on and so forth. Self-help versus mutual help. So self-help implies that the individuals in treatment are the main contributors to the change process. So they themselves are the ones that, you know, will need to say, you know what, I don't know how to go about getting my driver's license back. What can I do? And I don't have the money to pay for the exam you know, maybe get new glasses or glasses, you know, I need glasses and I, I won't pass the eye exam. So, you know, what are some of the things that they need to make sure that they gain in order to make that change? And then mutual help. So it means that the individuals also assume partial responsibility for the recovery of their peers. So as people become, you know, sober and healthy, then they look back at, you know, some of their peers who are still struggling and say, you know what, come on, let's, um, let's go to AA meetings together or, you know, what can I do to help you to, you know, maintain your home um, or get your kids back, you know. Maybe they're maintaining a very dysfunctional relationship with a, with a, a spouse that continues to be a problem in, in getting their kids back in their home. You know, when you really take a good look at who can benefit from therapeutic community, these are the ones that you have to really take a good look at. You know, these, these are the clients that are in need of improving their social skills. For example, you know, dressing properly and, you know, finding um, just clothes so when they go interview for a job, you know, they look presentable. I'm not saying they need to be wearing a suit and tie or, you know, a business suit or a dress or whatever, but that their clothes are clean, that, you know, they, they look presentable. And by just providing them with some sort of social support, because a lot of times as folks are sobering up, you know, they have not had a lot of support in, you know, mentoring. Um, and a lot of times, you know, folks have more than one issue. For example, you know, let's say they have a mental health issue. They have, excuse me, they have legal issues. You know, they're, they're struggling to maintain a home, so they're, you know, there's homelessness. They don't have a job, so, you know, their socioeconomic status is poverty, you know, and it's, there's so many different pieces to all of this. Maybe they just, they have, they have never achieved their high school diploma or a GED, so, you know, the only jobs that they can get are the ones that pay just minimum wage, which is not enough to help them maintain a home. So, you know, the, the lack of self-maintenance skills and needs assistance with the structure of how they're building their life, you know, this is where you really, when you got a therapeutic community, this is where you identify the ones who really could benefit from either more rehabilitation or habilitation to help them move forward in their life. You know, getting that job so they can get their own place and being able to, you know, afford or figuring out what they can truly afford. You know, yeah, they can't go to a rent -a center and get a, you know, big old 56 inch flat screen TV and home theater and, and you know, furniture, you know, as they move into their new house. You know, they, they will never make that work. And, you know, that will just mess up their credit even more. You know, the fundamental, co fundamental components is that residential facilities separate from other programs and away from drug-related environments really um, can become a, a, a good foundation 
for you know the folks that need structure. You know, um, let's say they've they've completed their treatment process, but you know they still need some very structured guidance and you know just behavioral tasks like going grocery shopping, like um, balancing a checkbook, um, putting a, a meal plan together. You know, like uh, week-long um, meals and and then shopping for that and sticking to the their shopping um, list and, and of course then being able to make the meals on a daily basis. You know, they will be able to provide clear and structured um, behavioral norms. So, you know, making sure they go to bed at a certain time and wake up at a certain time. Because a lot of these folks have had no bedtime, meaning they just stay up all night and sleep all day. So the norms that are reinforced are specific incentives and specific disincentives. So by you know, reinforcing certain behavior with you know certain things, the incentive, you know, is always a really good thing. But when you realize that they are starting to slack again, take away those dis those incentives. You know, say you know you'll get it back when when you get back on track. And their own peers tend to play a major role in their development as well as you know maintaining their behavioral norms. So for example. You know, they recognize that they're staying out late and, and sleeping all day. You know, they're, they're should be the ones that would be quick to say, you know what, you need to go to bed at night. You need to, you know, you have that job interview in the morning or you need to go to work in the morning. Um, you know, this is all part of your plan to get your kids back or, you know, whatever their, their main goal in life was beyond treatment. You know, they, it is a well-known fact that the residents do progress through the stages and the phases with greater privileges and responsibilities as incentives. Um, so, you know, the more uh, they do and how well they do will grant them more freedom to do more things, and, and not just in that program, but in life. You know, so as somebody shows their ability to get stuff done and do it efficiently and quickly, they are going to be given more tasks and more responsibility. Now, whether a person can handle that or not is a very, very um, key factor, you know, because a lot of times they may not know uh, until it's too late, until they're too overwhelmed to um, recognize, oh my God, I shouldn't have taken on so much. So to, you know, make sure that their routine and their activities are structured and well able to be maintained or achievable, I guess. Um, and it is really important that the staff maintain a responsibility and support for their safety and guidance as they are learning and gaining all the skills and tools in their life. So therapeutic communities approach, their therapeutic approach focuses on changing maladaptive patterns of thinking and behaving through the use of, you got, you know, of course, individual and group therapy, their group therapy, their skills, um, groups with their peers, community-based learning, um, peer confrontation, because there's a healthy way to confront each other. You know, let's say peers start borrowing money from each other or borrowing things from another, and they never give them back. So what happens? They start feeling, you know, upset, and and they start they stop communicating with each other because, you know, for whatever reasons. And it's important that you help them deal with this confrontation. You know, to give them the power to ask for their item back or their whatever, and the other person to state, you know, why they hung on to the object or the money as long as they did, and hopefully come to a resolution where you can say, you know what, from this point on, you are not to, you know, ask other people for money, or you are not allowed to give, you know, whatever money you have, or lend out your clothes, or whatever it is, you know, let's just not do that anymore. And to continue to role play real life scenarios, you know, even, even within games, you know, there's a lot of board games that you can um, order this or have this kind of stuff going on. 
therapeutic community structures, and they're, of course, very community-based. Um, a lot of times, these are 12 to 24 months, which is ultimately the desirable um, outcome. But a lot of times, with funding issues, it, it just can never happen. Our program, um, before we closed down our transitional living centers due to um, renovation, we allowed clients to stay with us up to 24 months. And then, because we were able to have an extra house for a while there, even longer than that, because you know, there's housing issues around here. You know, um, keeping jobs, getting jobs, and keeping jobs. And then, of course, you know, um, we tried to get them jobs with other collaborative programs. You know, for example, a lot of ranchers need ranch hands. Um, there's houses that need to be worked on through different programs here, the Housing Authority, Property and Supply. So, you know, they're always needing um, different workers. And, of course, you know, with um, the jails and prisons, you know, we do have a detox program that isn't technically a detox program, but that's what they call it. And they end up, a lot of folks end up staying there because they just need structure. Um, we have some shelter, we have a, a homeless shelter in town. And then, of course, our treatment facility, um, we did have two transitional living centers that, you know, we were able to keep folks um, in a very structured setting um, that was actually very nice. We, we got it set up very nice. Now, there's three stages of a therapeutic community. So you got the induction, which is an, an early treatment. Then you got the primary treatment. And then you got a reentry program. There's daily lives in a therapeutic community. And well, the daily life, they have clinical groups, which include psychoeducational, therapy, skills, and vocational. I, um, I really, really like that they have these therapeutic community meetings. And it's not just about the clinical issues. It's like, you know, what is overall going on in the community that needs to be addressed. Because a lot of times, you know, the administrators um, have, you know, no idea what's going on at the ground level. And it's within these meetings that, you know, a lot of these issues will come out. You know, and, and to be involved in the larger community outside these therapeutic communities is also a plus. Like in Hawaii, for example, the growing food and selling at farmer's markets. Well, you know, we do have a youth program here on our reservation that tends to, um, you know, work with the kids, teaching them how to garden. And then every Friday in the summertime up until, you know, winter, October, I guess, they sell all their food at their farmer's market. Plus they also make, you know, jellies and jams and, um, you know, all kinds of canned good salsas and marinara sauces for spaghetti or pastas. And so, you know, the, the kids are really taught a lot. And I think that is a, a growing, um, sustainable um, way to, you know, build different programs. And I think by having, you know, involvement with the larger community is a plus. And they, you know, this may help reduce the stigma of continued substance abuse by having the clients volunteer in the larger community, you know, and that's what we did. We had a collaborative garden with the youth um, program here, and so they were able to have, you know, some of the fruits and veggies, and they turned around and made, you know, many things. They made zucchini bread, they made soups, you know, I mean, they, they just, they really liked you know, going out and working in the garden and then bringing back the fruits of their labor and then turning around and having dinner with it. And they really felt um, like, you know, they, they were productive, very productive in their life, in their daily life. Here's some links um, that would be um, really key in reading more about these therapeutic communities. And if you get a chance, you know, I really encourage you to um, check them out. And I hope you all have a copy of this um, either sent to you or um, 
you know, you could just copy these down. So, in the, pre the summary of the presentation, we define tasks of the group leader, the development of the group, you know, the size, the norms, the rules, all of that. Then you be described and, and select and appropriately use strategies from accepted and culturally appropriate models for group counseling. And then ultimately be became familiar with research on group counseling. So at this point, um, I guess this is an opportunity for group um, discussion. And I'm hoping that people had questions. Um, Hi, Denise. And I, I'm turning it back over to Karen. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for um, sharing yeah, your knowledge on, on group counseling with us today. So. Um, at this time, like Denise said, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and type them in the chat box at this time, and I'll pass them along to her. Um, we have a comment. Great presentation. Okay, and we have our first, our first question. Can you share some examples of games you use for role playing? You know, um, when I was, I was uh, when I was working on my doctorate at the University of South Dakota. I, one of my clinical placements was at the Winnebago Youth Shelter down in Winnebago. And at that point, I had only been kind of taught group therapy from a kind of a Western model. And so I was trying to use these techniques on these native kids. And most of the kids that are in this youth shelter are the worst of the worst, you know, the bad kids who come from very broken homes and are, you know, using substances and in and out of jail and treatment and so on and so forth. And I was, my first two group sessions with them, I couldn't maintain their attention. I mean, they were talking to each other, just completely ignoring me. And I felt so <laughs> not competent. I was like, what in the world am I going to do with these kids? So I finally just did a I did a prayer, <laughs> asked the Creator to help me because I really wanted to reach these kids, and I started doing a search online, and I come across this um, uh, cur curriculum called the Project Eagle, and it was the psychologist out of the University of Oklahoma. The main person is uh, Rocky Robbins, and in this article, um, Project Eagle, there was a curriculum for uh, Native American youth group activities, and we did these activities, and the kids loved it. It went from where they totally ignored me to the minute they heard me coming in the door, they were just like, why don't we have in group? And this um, was so successful with these kids. I got them to, you know, really share and open up, and it was able. I was able to do it from a very cultural, culturally based. Even though I'm not Winnebago or Omaha, you know, I'm Lakota from South Dakota. I was still able to connect with these kids, and a lot of times, you know, um, the group themselves, the activity, you know, allowed them to really take a good look at their own behavior. You know, um, there's one called Accepting the Honor, A, and that was looking at how they accept compliments or give, you know, fake, false com uh, uh, compliments. Um, there's another one on, it's, you could use it for bullying. Um, one was called the Eagle Indian Naming um, Ceremony, and then that one played directly into another one called Counting Coup. And so, you know, you really worked with them on from a very cultural basis. And then role playing, you know, you, I guess, you know, as you get to know your, your group members a little bit more, you start realizing what were some of the themes that continue to be brought up. And then maybe, you know, if you ever have any of Virginia Satir's uh, family therapy where she sculpts, you know, you sculpt family members, that actually, to me, is one of the best ways to um, do some role playing, you know, for, fam for, for people to recognize how the family dynamic really functions.
for people. Um, and I guess I'll end right there with that one. Thank you. Thank you. It's a lot of really good examples. Um, our next question is, what do you do to address transference in a group? You know, it's funny because I have had people drop out of individual sessions as well as um, group sessions because I learned after the fact that they had serious transfer issues with me. So that caused me to be more insightful. You know, when I see that person really struggling, I try to take them to the side and find out, you know, away from the group. And I don't address it in the group because if I, if I see somebody really struggling, you know, not only to talk or just to even be present, you know, like say they start, start skipping group, you know, I really take them aside, you know, I ask them to come in, you know, maybe a half an hour before group starts and to really try to find out, you know, what is going on, why are you missing group or why are you not speaking, do you feel intimidated, do you not feel safe? You know, and, and a lot of times, you know, anymore, I find that that's what's happening, is I remind them of somebody in their life. And, you know, maybe that person has passed on, and that's why it's even more difficult to um, determine what's, what's what, you know. Um, and so that's, that's just one way that I've dealt with the transference, is I try to, I really try to catch it prior to it getting more full you know, full-blown um, by just meeting with them as, you know, separately, individually versus, you know, confronting it in the group. And if it does become an issue that brought out during the group, then I, and then I address it right there in group. Thank you. Um. Our next question is, what considerations do you find helpful in matching clients to groups? Well, I think um, by doing a thorough background history, you know, that includes, you know, the medical piece, the legal piece, as well as, you know, the behavior health and the um, family history, well, you know, as well as, you know, the, within behavior health, you know, any mental health and substance abuse and so on and so forth, that by doing a more thorough as thorough as possible um, background history as I can do, especially with the, the family piece, that really gives me an idea whether or not this per person is appropriate for group, what group, and or if they should just be an, an individual until, you know, they work through some of the deeper issues, and then maybe they can move on to a group setting. Mm. Because it's, you don't want to put somebody in a space that they're not ready for. You know, you can do more harm than good. Thank you. Um, and our next question is, how can you build cohesiveness with clients who are involuntarily participating? That is a very good question. <laughs> and that is, that is um, actually a struggle that we continue to have here in our own department because, you know, the cohesiveness can go either way. The cohesiveness can go where, you know, these guys basically <laughs> get the group to just continue to use, out, especially if they're, we're outpatient, we're not inpatient. So when they leave here, you know, we we hear that two or three of them are still drinking or still you know smoking up together, mm -hmm. and so it's at that point that we have to take each person on an individual basis, and you know check in with them you know and if they're not ready for group then you know they need to be you know sent on to a higher level of care because you know they're they're actually you know without the group leaders not and until we get that information that they're still you know a cohort. Uh, unhealthy cohort outside of the group, you know, then, you know, you, it's, I guess, the way to make them um, connect, too, is by establishing the, the themes that this group has 
you know, stated. You know, what are some of the main things that you guys are experiencing here? And have them share. You know, like let's say three-fourths of the group is involuntarily committed. So ultimately, they don't want to be here. And just make it that, you know, okay, so you don't want to be here, but you have to be here. And in order to get out of this commitment, you need to achieve all of these things. And so why not just do it? You know, just get through this treatment process and see what you feel like, you know, in the end. You know, maybe you feel good waking up sober for three weeks in a row, you know. And when was the last time you woke up feeling really, really good instead of hungover and whatever, you know. So it, it, it can vary. It really can vary as to how to get the group to become cohesive. But I think by really trying to identify what themes are running through the group is one good way to do that. Um, our next question is, can you identify any strategies to address clicks within the group? Wow, that's interesting. We, we experience that a lot. And it's really difficult because um, I can see it happening with the females a lot more than the males, where the females um, tend to um, click together and leave out certain females. Now, some females are able to handle it and, you know, just move on with their life, but some females really do feel it and feel left out. Now, by addressing, you know, with both groups, you know, the, the female who's left out or females who are left out versus the group, the girls that are in the group, you know, find out what is going on. And here's the other thing I have found is uh, in our transitional living centers, the staff actually... Um, I would have to check the staff, too, because then the staff would take sides almost, you know, and I, I'm just like, why would you do that? You know, you need to maintain, you know, professionalism here. Well, because, you know, she's, you know, what the girls are saying is about one girl, this is one instance, is that um, she loved to flirt. So she flirted with all the men in the, in the you know, the halfway houses or transitional living centers, as well as the male staff. And they really didn't like that about her. And then when it was confronted, you know, the girl claims she didn't realize she was flirting and that, that that's just who she is. And she was really a beautiful girl. So I think, you know, the, ultimately what we were looking at is a lot of intimidation from her beauty and then, of course, a lot of jealousy. And that really is always a difficult thing to do because um, I've had to sit down with the whole group and help them identify, you know, what is that? Why Why is this happening? Why are you guys leaving her out? And then they'll say, well, she never wants to come. And I said, you know, well, have you asked her? And then comes to find out that they really haven't. They literally left this person out. They never, never extended, you know, invitations for her to, you know, go do things with them. And, you know, so then we turn it back and say, well, what if you were left out? You know, you weren't invited to these things. How would you feel? You know, so it's almost like you have to make sure that everybody understands the dynamics that's taking place, whether they intentionally are leaving people out or, or they're, um, how would you describe it, you know, not, not you know, inviting folks and not being, letting them continue to be part of the group. Thank you. Our next question is, what are some warning signs that someone's not ready for a group? <clears throat> a lot of times um, they will stop coming. They, they're just the high absenteeism. Um, maybe there's a lot of tears, you know. Um, a lot of anger, and it's at that moment that, you know, because we, we have staffing three times a week, and the counselors will let us know, I don't think this person is ready for group or is appropriate for group. You know, here are some of the things that's happening, and then we'll say, okay, you know, so-and-so, can you do individual with this person and, and instead of, you know, so we literally will pull them out of the group and place them in individual. Um, 
it's, you know, I guess it, it varies. Um, and maybe the person themselves will alert the counselor. I can't do this. You know, I'm not ready to share what's really happening to me yet. Um, maybe, maybe the treatment group isn't the the key thing. You know, maybe they need to be more in counsel. You know, therapy for a behavior health issue that they're experiencing. You know, maybe they're feeling more suicidal or more depressed. Or, you know, it, it varies. I mean, it, the the situation varies. But I do know that we've had to pull folks out of group because they truly weren't ready for that bigger group process due to, you know, their own, you know, reasonings, I guess you could say. Thank you. Well, it looks like that's all the questions that we have at this time. So we'll move forward and wrap up. Um, once again, I'd like to thank you, Denise, for sharing your knowledge with us today. Um, I think it's just been a really valuable presentation, so we thank you for that. Thank you, and thank you for asking me, and, and you're welcome. Um, okay. So please watch for our email with handouts for this webinar. Our attachments will include our CEU request form, our PowerPoint handout, and a link to our customer satisfaction survey. We appreciate if you decide to participate in our survey, as completion of these surveys allows us to show SAMHSA the number of people served by our webinar. And to participate in our customer satisfaction survey, just follow the link that you'll receive in that email, along with the handouts. We hope you'll be able to join us for the next webinar in this series, Counseling Families, Partners, and Significant Others, which will be presented on Wednesday, November 20th at the same time from noon to 1.30 Central Time. <clears throat> and finally, we'd just like to thank you for participating in the session today. We hope you've enjoyed the session, and we look forward to hearing your feedback. So thank you. <laughs>